Lord be with you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Good morning and welcome to our online worship service today at St. Andrew Presbyterian Church. Wherever you are, I am glad that you are with us, that we are one in the spirit, even if we are not one in geography. It is good to have you with us this morning, and we are delighted to be able to worship uh, with you. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but we are always glad to hear from you. If you want to email us or send us a note on Facebook uh, with prayer requests or concerns or questions or comments, anything you want. And we do a lot of communication by email, and if you want to be added to our email list so that you can be included in the prayer requests and information about the church, uh, please let us know, and we will add you to that. Um, I just want to say a word about where we're headed uh, as far as sermons are concerned. Uh, I think I remember before the middle of March, I'm having trouble remembering anything before the middle of March, we were studying the Sermon on the Mount, and we suspended that as this pandemic hit, and we had to deal with some other things, but I believe it's time for us to return to that, and we had been, we had just begun looking at the Lord's Prayer uh, at that time, and so we're going to back up today and begin with a, an overview of the first piece of, of the Lord's Prayer, and then proceed on from there. So we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount uh, for a while if you want to read ahead and pray over that and study up on it. But I'm really excited about that particular uh, journey that we'll be taking together. Uh, we've received some inquiries about whether or not we're going to be opening back up for in-person worship soon. And I will tell you, the session is meeting tomorrow night and we'll be talking about that. But I will also tell you, don't get your hopes up too soon. I think that I'm aware of some churches that have opened back up and then had to close again because of an outbreak of this virus. And we just want to be cautious. Uh, we don't want to be guinea pigs. And I'll let you all know what the session decides uh, tomorrow night. But I thank you for your faithfulness in this extraordinary time. And we will continue to worship and to serve God together wherever we are. Will you join me now in our invitation to worship from Psalm 68? Sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, exult before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we gather today to worship you and to praise your name and to celebrate all the things that you are doing among us. And we ask you, God, to let us see your hand, even in the midst of our hard times, that we might praise you for who you are and for what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. Let us give an ear to your word this morning. Let us give ourselves wholly to the worship of you, that we might be renewed and restored and refreshed for what are, whatever you have in mind for each of us this week as your people gather and then scatter to serve our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is, This Is My Father's World. <clears throat> My father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. And the wonders wrought. This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. I 
meditate on that third verse for a long time, and I recommend it to you. Will you join me now in our prayer of confession? Oh Lord our God, we confess that even on our best days we still fall far short of your glory and your purpose for us. We claim to be your children, but disobey your commands. We pray selfishly, forgive reluctantly, and share grudgingly. We fear the world too much while trusting you too little. Renew our hearts by your Holy Spirit, Father, and revive us again. Let your word be planted in our hearts that your light may shine through our lives and that the love of Christ our Savior might be poured out as a blessing wherever you send us. Amen. Hear the good news. God being rich in mercy, has made us who were dead in our sinfulness, has made us alive together with Christ, for it is by grace that we are saved through faith in him. And I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you and I are truly, truly forgiven. And I know we all have a lot of things to be in prayer about these days, but I want to recommend some things to you specifically uh, be in prayer for our sister Sheila Tucker. As you know, she's been battling cancer in her lungs for a while. She's been undergoing chemo and has been doing really well. Uh, at a doctor's appointment this week, they discovered another spot on her lung that's outside the area of concern that has been treated. And so they're going to expand her chemo and increase it this coming week. And it is disheartening for her. And I ask you to reach out to her and lift her up with your prayers and with your love and pray that God would do what he needs to do for her in this time. Uh, Debbie Long has asked for renewed prayer for a longtime friend, Brian Hatcher, who is also battling cancer, which has continued to spread through his body despite every effort that they uh, have been able to make. Uh, he is currently hospitalized, and his wife, Tracy, is unable to visit him, and their two children are also unable to see him. And I just ask you to lift Brian and that family up uh, in prayer. Uh, Betsy Penrow has asked for continued prayer for a friend named Jay Samples, who is battling cancer and having a very hard time of it. And she's also asked for prayer for Annette Caldwell, who I believe is having a kidney removed uh, tomorrow. Uh, Yvette Andrews has asked for prayer for the man who cuts her yard because he is going through a hard time and having some health struggles and we need to continue to pray for Yvette as she recovers from her automobile accident and continues to deal with a number of health problems on her own. I also ask your special prayers uh, for my wife Angie and for all her family. Her grandmother Etna Johnson passed away this week at the age of 102. And we were able to be with her a couple of years ago for her 100th birthday, and it was just a delight to have all those generations of the family together. And I remember vividly that she said the blessing uh, for that meal, and uh, she went home peacefully, and one of her daughters was with her, and uh, her service will be this coming Tuesday. We'll be traveling to uh, Carrollton, Georgia. Uh, for that. But I ask you to be in prayer for Angie and all her family as we celebrate the, the life of this great woman. We continue to wrestle with all of the junk that is swirling around us, with the conflict in our streets, with the virus that seems to be in every bit of the air that we breathe or every surface that we touch. We don't know who to believe and we don't know who to trust and we are very perplexed. Schools are planning to open and we're not all certain that that's really a good idea. And we just have to settle ourselves and remember that this is our Father's world and that he is in charge. And wherever we are going, 
He is going with us. And that we have everything that we need for whatever we face. Now, we have to remind ourselves of this on a routine basis. And we have to remind each other because otherwise we'll forget it and we'll get scared. So with all of the junk that is going on, let us go now to God in prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, your people gather before you this morning seeking to praise you and also to hear a word from you that will give us hope and that will give us courage, that will give us some wisdom for the facing of these days. Father, we are beset on every side with extreme difficulty, and this virus that we are dealing with has turned out not to be such an easy thing after all. And we confess, Lord, that we do not know where to turn for good knowledge and wisdom. We confess that we are afraid of the turmoil that we see in our streets as we wrestle with long-standing things in our culture that we need to be wrestling with. And yet, we also are afraid of how tempers have reached a boiling point and some people do not know where the boundaries are. Father, we ask that you would show us how to live in the face of these things, that when conflict comes, we would seek neither to escalate it nor escape from it. Remind us, Father, that in Christ we are in the world but not of it, and that our lives are to model the graciousness and humility and love and forgiveness of Jesus himself to all whom we encounter, whether we agree with them or not, whether they are treating us well or not, and especially, especially those with whom we disagree the most, especially with those who we feel are our adversaries, indeed, who may even be people we consider our enemies. God, remind us that every single human being is made in your eternal image. And even though for some of us that image may be tarnished and darkened almost beyond recognition, remind us that there is no human soul beyond redemption in Jesus Christ. That every person is infinitely worthy and valuable. And that you have sent us as ambassadors for Christ as missionaries to bear this good news to a hurting world that desperately needs to know where we can find hope in the middle of hopelessness and where we can find courage in the middle of chaos. Oh Lord, let us look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who showed us the way. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and strip us of the things that interfere with the Spirit of Christ infusing us in the way that we speak, in the way that we respond, in the way that we touch others with our words and our actions. God, show us how not to cower in fear, but rather to seek out those who are hurting, to befriend those who are friendless, to be on the side of the poor and the dispossessed, the alienated, and those who we consider outcasts in our society. Remind us, Father, that your love embraces every human being and that we are to model that love regardless of the cost to ourselves. This is so far beyond us as to almost be laughable. It is a pathetic thing to do in our own strength, and we confess we're not equal to it. 
So God, have mercy on us. Forgive the ways we have not loved one another as we have been loved in Christ. Forgive us when we have not loved our brothers and sisters as ourselves. Show us the way, Lord, that we might walk in it. Give us your power and your purpose and your passion for other people so that we would no longer be so wrapped up in our own stuff that we ignore the suffering of those around us. God, we trust that you are in charge of this world. And so we ask you to give us the boldness that comes from knowing that. This world is so deeply troubled and we are wondering, is this the time when our Savior will return and set things to rights? Oh, how we long for that day and we ask that you would hasten it, but we remember that when that day comes, there will be no second chances for those who have not yet turned in repentance and faith to our Savior. So give us a sense of urgency, Lord, above all things, an urgency in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, the very source of hope and healing and joy, deep-seated joy, even in the middle of the worst that life can throw at us. Because we know, we know that in Jesus Christ all things, all things even now, are being made new. Let us catch a glimpse of that newness today, Father. Let us be participants in it and not those who hinder it. Show us how to live and especially show us how to die for the sake of Christ as we take up our cross daily to be his disciples and follow him in the way of love. And we ask it in his mighty name, praying as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Our Old Testament reading today comes from the 103rd Psalm, verses 13 and 14. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And then if you'll turn with me to the sixth chapter of Matthew, beginning uh, at the 7th verse, going down through the 10th verse. 
And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us now. Open the eyes of our minds and our hearts and our spirits that we may truly see what you have for us this day and hear your word and in hearing let us be joyfully obedient to your call and now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight O Lord our rock and our redeemer amen I have to tell you I am very excited about being back in the Sermon on the Mount and I will tell you this I believe that if we truly became a people who saturated ourselves in the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing, not skipping any of the hard parts, we would be able to bear witness to Christ in a way that the world would have to sit up and take notice and would want some of for themselves. So I encourage you uh, this week, as you have time, to go back and begin at the beginning. Go back with the, at the fifth chapter, start with the Beatitudes and read on through it, and read through it slowly. Meditate on it, chew over it, and listen to what God is saying to you as we consider how this is the framework, the constitution for the kingdom of God that Jesus is describing. Some of us are old enough to recall a TV show from the 50s called Father Knows Best. And it's no exaggeration to say that the portrayal of the father figure in that show is vastly different from the typical portrayal of fatherhood in shows today. For one thing, there was actually a stable father figure in the home, something that's almost unheard of in our time. And what's more, not only was a father present, but he was actually regarded as a wise and comforting presence for his family. If there was a problem, dad could fix it. Nowadays, if dad is present at all, not only is he not seen as wise and comforting in the face of problems, but more often than not, he's the one creating problems by being a blundering doofus who is typically out of touch. And in some cases, the father figure is downright dark bordering on evil. Now most of us had fathers who fell somewhere between these two examples, but whether your father was practically a saint or was evidently on the devil's payroll, we all tend to conceptualize our heavenly father based on our experience with our earthly fathers as a frame of reference. And I know that many people, and I'm not blaming anybody for this, I know many people have a very hard time thinking of God as their father because of the difficult relationship they have with their own father. And for some, the idea is almost repulsive. But whenever we approach spiritual matters from an earthly perspective, an earthly vantage point, we go sideways almost immediately. But then the question would be raised, we live on earth, we're earthly beings, how else are we supposed to understand and approach these things? And that is a great question. But the answer is that God has revealed himself to us in his word. And that is a really good thing because otherwise we would never get a handle on it at all. So set your own experience with your own father to the side for a minute and consider what it means to say the words our Father in heaven. First of all, we have to recognize that no religious tradition outside the Judeo-Christian perspective teaches that God is our Father. And what's more, in the Old Testament, the fatherhood of God is spoken of in relation mostly in, to the nation of Israel in general terms, uh, not really specific to individuals. 
In the Gospels, however, particularly in Matthew and John, God is referred to as Father over 100 times. And this is affirmed repeatedly throughout the New Testament. Now we need to be clear on something. While all human beings are created in God's image and are therefore infinitely valuable in his sight, that is not the same as saying that all people have God as their true Father. In John's Gospel, in the first chapter, verses 9 through 14, we read this. The true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. Now listen to this. He gave the right to be called children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To become a child of God is something that originates with God. Let me put it this way. Did you choose to be the offspring of whoever it is that is your earthly father? No, you and I had absolutely nothing to do with it. And in the same way, God is our heavenly father because he is the one that initiates that Relationship. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy and blameless before him. In love, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. God becomes our father as we are adopted by him into the divine family through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And what's more, God is our heavenly father. And what I mean by that is he is the essence of perfection and power. In Matthew chapter 7, and we'll get to it later on in this process of of going through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about trusting God as we are seeking and knocking and asking for the things that we need. And he says, which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things? To those who ask him, Jesus doesn't sugarcoat a thing, does he? If y'all who are evil know how to be good to your children, don't you think your heavenly father knows how to be good to you? Because we have a heavenly father, we can say with Paul, there's that great verse in Romans 8, 28, which is true because we have a heavenly father. And we know, we know that for those who love God, all things. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Whatever it is, my heavenly father will work things out for my good. And your heavenly father will work things out for your good. And this is true for all who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. And by the way, it's not my father in heaven or your father in heaven, but our father. In heaven, we can never lose sight of that. Christianity is a team sport. And unless you're stuck on a desert island by yourself somewhere, you have no basis, no basis for isolating yourself from your brothers and sisters in Christ, the family that God purchased for you with the blood of Christ. Do not insult Christ by insulting his bride, the church, by staying apart from it. You need your heavenly family and they need you. Now I know finding a good family in the church can be a real pain, but it is worth the effort and God calls you to it. And you cannot rest until you settle in a place where Jesus is lifted up and you understand that the fatherhood of God applies not just to you, but to all the rest of us as well. Knowing that God is our heavenly father, we can then begin to pray properly. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. You know, if we sincerely and fervently 
prayed for nothing but those three things every day, our lives and this world would be absolutely transformed. When we speak of hallowing God's name, it means so much more than just trying to avoid swearing when we use God's name. To seek that God's name would be hallowed is to seek God's glory above all things. To desire that the things that are done in God's name would reflect God's true character. To seek that the people who bear God's name would live up to the family resemblance. I tell you the truth, the biggest obstacle that non-believers have to the Christian faith is the example of far too many Christians. Mahatma Gandhi once said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Of course, something everybody needs to keep in mind is that we are not called to follow other Christians. We are called to follow Jesus Christ, and we do not preach Christianity. We preach Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of the world. Nonetheless, nonetheless, shame on us if our following Christ is so unchristlike that non-believers have no desire to get to know him any better, to want to seek to walk in his ways. Which leads us to these next petitions. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, in order to have a kingdom... You have to have what? A king. And as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we honor Jesus Christ as king of kings and lord of lords. And that's important for us to remember, especially in an election year. I don't care who the president is. We serve a king first and foremost, and his rule and his authority and his word take precedence in our lives. So the kingdom of God is found where Jesus is acknowledged as king and where the righteousness of God is displayed. Everything that needs to be said about the kingdom of God is summed up in that word righteousness. Now depending on how you are wired, that word means different things to different people. And I'll tell you, religious conservatives tend to believe that righteousness really means pursuing good moral behavior for individuals. Our religious liberals tend to think that righteousness means pursuing a just society for all. Which one is right? Well, they're both right. You can't have one without the other. The righteousness of the kingdom is revealed in God's word to us, and that word tells us that both personal righteousness and righteousness in our society are essential components of God's kingdom. And the desire for personal holiness and the longing for social justice are signs to us that what we are really seeking is the kingdom of God. Pastor and author Frederick Bickner says this, The kingdom of God is what all of us hunger for above all things. Even when we don't know its name or realize it's what we are starving to death for. The kingdom of God is where our best dreams come from and our truest prayers. We glimpse it at those moments when we find ourselves being better than we are. A wiser than we know. The kingdom of God is where we belong. It is home. And whether we realize it or not, I think all of us are homesick for it. Boy, is that so true. When we say, thy kingdom come, we are seeking to frame our lives according to the constitution of heaven and asking our heavenly father to rule in our hearts through the righteousness of Christ, which is ours through faith. And finally, we have to summon the courage to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me ask you something. When, do you think that when the Lord asked Gabriel to go tell Mary that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah, that Gabe was like, you know, I'm not sure I got time for that. Let me check my calendar. Uh, couldn't you ask somebody else? Or That's really not a job I want to do. Uh, send Michael or one of the others. Yeah, I don't think so. In heaven, God's will is not questioned. It is not subverted. It is not ignored. It's obeyed instantly. Instantly. And that should be the desire of our hearts. Mm. What we've got to get through our heads is that doing the will of God 
is actually what will bring us the deepest satisfaction and truest joy in this life, even when God's will is hard. And make no mistake, it often is. In Matthew 26, you remember Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This is what the author of Hebrews is referring to in the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2, where he says, Let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus experienced agony and pain in his crucifixion, the depths of which we will never comprehend. Yet he submitted to the will of his Father for the sake of the joy that was set before him. It was absolutely worth it. The joy was deeper than the pain, and the glory was far greater than the shame, and the same holds true for us. We look at whatever difficult thing we might be facing when we're trying to follow God's will, and we stop short, not realizing how much peace and joy and wholeness are in store for us if we will just be obedient to the will of God. Paul gives us the key for this in Romans 12, verse 2. Do not, do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do you know what the will of God is for your life? It is to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. What Paul referred to in Colossians 1.27 as Christ in you, the hope of glory. When Christ is formed in us, then the name of God will indeed be hallowed in all that we do, and the kingdom of God will be revealed as his people rejoice in his reign in their lives. Every day of our lives, we have to resist being shaped according to the will of the world around us and submit to the will of God. And the way for us to discern the will of God is to immerse ourselves in the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit, yes, but we always need to remember that the Holy Spirit is never going to reveal something to us that is going to contradict what he's already said to us in the inspired and infallible and inerrant word of God. You want to know the mind of God, the heart of God, the will of God? Study and meditate on and pray over the word of God every day. And ask God to reveal his will to you and give you the desire for his will above everything else. And then see how your life is redeemed and restored and renewed and refreshed in Christ as Christ is formed in you. Friends, if you belong to Jesus Christ, then God truly is your heavenly father. And he will never forsake you, never leave you or give you anything less than his best. So hallow and honor his name in all that you say and do. Seek his kingdom and work to reveal that kingdom to others and trust his will for your life, being obedient to his word because the truth is our heavenly father really does know best. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we are so thankful that you are our Heavenly Father. And we are thankful that you have given us your word that we might not wonder what it is that you want from us. And we are thankful that in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is renewing us and transforming us into the image of our Savior. Oh, help us, God, for we are weak. Strengthen us, show us the way, and give us joy for the journey, knowing that you are with us every step of the way. Let everything be done for your glory as we hallow your name and proclaim your kingdom to the world. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen.
I do want to say thank you to those of you who are faithfully supporting St. Andrew uh, with your contributions. And I encourage uh, anyone else, if you have not yet taken that step, we would love for you to participate with us in this great mission. Our church supports about 10 different ministries, from Gap Ministries to Thornwell Orphanage to uh, the Lydia Project to an organization that helps get girls out of sex trafficking rings. We are not ignoring the pain and suffering of the world, but we can't do it without your help. So we thank you for your contributions and we invite you to participate with us as we seek to proclaim this kingdom of God here, right here in Augusta. Will you join me now in our affirmation of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is, He Leadeth Me. Blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught, whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me, his faithful. me in our charge. He has showed you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace this day, now and forever. Amen.